Um, welcome everyone. I'm excited for tonight's meeting. Uh, we've got Dan Willie. He's of fruitmentor.com and the Fruit Mentor YouTube channel, um, which I've been a fan of for quite a while. He's got, uh, well, a bit about Dan. So he, as mentioned, he does live in Australia, although you'll notice uh, John and him switched accents for the night. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's, he's actually, uh, he could tell you more about originally where he's from, but I know he lived in the Bay Area for many years. Uh, Dan's a computer engineer. He's also an inventor, uh, which I had looked up. He's got over 100 patents uh, on the, the patent office. And I hadn't, we hadn't talked about that yet. Um, and he is a lover of delicious fruit. Uh, he started Fruit Mentor to be of service to others who enjoy eating and growing delicious fruit. Uh, on his website, readers can expect to find articles that will help them grow the most delicious fruit. And on his YouTube channel, uh, he's very much focused on uh, grafting, which is what makes him extremely appropriate for tonight. His videos are, are very instructional, very well edited, very succinct. Um, and he has a particular focus at this point uh, through Fruit Mentor on citrus. And uh, you could see that through his videos, very wonderful education about citrus diseases, specifically Huang Long Bing virus and uh, keeping everyone safe moving fruit around. So tonight, Dan's gonna be talking with us uh, first and foremost about grafting since we do have the sign exchange coming up this weekend. And he's also got a special treat where he's gonna be discussing his work with the Citrus Clonal Protection Program and various citrus agencies to introduce new citrus varieties to the United States that aren't currently available. And uh, you all get a chance to participate in his uh, efforts by participating in a survey that we'll have in the meeting. We'll pull up some polls and you'll be voting on what you in particular would have interest in having introduced to the United States. Uh, so welcome Dan and thanks for, for coming from so far away. Thank you, that's a great introduction. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm originally from Georgia and my grandmother had a house in Florida and where I would go down there as a child and climb her, her orange tree and eat those oranges right off the tree. So I've always had a huge fondness for citrus. So I'll be talking about grafting a lot through the perspective of citrus, but most of these things will apply to other fruits as well. Um, after college, I moved to, let me start the sharing. After college, I moved to Chicago and worked for Motorola for eight years. And then in 2000, I moved to um, the San Francisco Bay Area for the dot-com boom. And finally moving to a state where I could grow citrus, I visited the citrus variety collection. I think it was probably in 2000 or 2001. And if you don't know the citrus variety collection in Riverside, it's like a Noah's Ark of citrus. They have two trees each of about, <clears throat> I think more than a thousand varieties. And in visiting the, the citrus variety collection, my, my mind was just blown about the possibilities for, for growing citrus at home. And I also learned about this program called the Citrus Clonal Protection Program where you can go online and you can order budwood of, they have hundreds of varieties. They don't have a thousand, but they do have hundreds of varieties. This video right here, this shows the interior of the screen structure where they cut your budwood when you, you order citrus budwood. So this, this screen structure protects the budwood from any insects that would infect the trees with citrus diseases. And they test the trees regularly to make sure that they're, they're free of disease. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you um, 
in this presentation, I have a lot of clips from my YouTube channel and the grafting clips, um, they're much abbreviated from what's on my YouTube channel because you could just go to the YouTube channel later. But what I'll do is I'll talk more about uh, when to use particular grafting techniques. And th this shows what you get when you order the budwood from the citrus clonal protection program. And this first, this first type of grafting isn't something you'll be doing at home, but what this technique is, is uh, a method that they use to remove diseases from new varieties being introduced to California. This uh, citrus, this technology, it's called shoot tip grafting. With this technology, they can remove all diseases from any citrus variety. And this is the only uh, legal way to introduce a citrus, a new citrus variety to the state of California. They grow seedlings, rootstock seedlings and test tubes. And then what they do is they graft, um, they graft to those shoots of the, um, of the variety that may be diseased and they cut the very tip of the, um, the apical meristem. You see he's removing all of the leaves. He cuts off the very tip and they'll graft that onto that seedling rootstock and then grow it in a test tube. And there you see, we have a, a penny for reference. So you could see how small that is. Um, but anyway, hey, with Dan, the, yes. Real quick interjection. Um, can you do a quick reshare oh, of I, the screen I, with I, the checked box? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, I forgot. No problem that. at all, no problem at all. Let's see, uh, sorry everyone. All right, we're back. Thank I, you. Sorry, I think I think I, I messed it up again. I did share sound. Okay, there we go. Is that better? Sorry, everyone. No problem. If you want to actually full screen the um, full screen the player, right? That'll pull that up full. And it's looking great now. Is that better? Yep, looks perfect. Thank you. So, so anyway, basically with this, this technology, they can, they can introduce any new citrus variety to California. And there you see, he, he puts it in an incubator and the success rate of this technique is about 10%. So they have to try many times before they get one to take. Most of those just, were just rootstock suckers, but the one in the middle succeeded there. And then af after they do that, they, what they do is a trick to get it to grow faster is they take that tiny little tree and they graft it to a rough lemon tree. So it, so it ends up being a double graft. So you have, have the rough lemon rootstock and then whatever the rootstock that they grew in the test tube and then the shoot tip grafted variety. So they, they do this and by doing that, they get, they get it to grow a lot faster. And that, that cuts a lot off of the process. So this shows the apical meristem right there. You can see that part. If they don't cut that just right, it can have, still have disease. So what they do is they test it after they do the shoot tip grafting. And they, they use PCR, which, which is the same technology used uh, used to detect COVID in humans. They, they're looking for parts of the uh, DNA or RNA of any virus or bacteria that they're, uh, they're concerned with. And that would include uh, Huang Long Bing, the, the biggest disease of concern in California. And just by looking at these graphs on the equipment, they can figure out if, uh, if that um, RNA or DNA is present and 
um, they can they can know if it could be introduced. This is actually my apartment in San Francisco after I moved um, and I visited the citrus variety collection and learned about all of this stuff. So even though I was living in a condo in the city, you, you could see on my balcony, I had a lot of citrus trees and I started to, uh, to learn how to graft um, even living in the city. And while I was living in the city, I learned about this disease in Florida. Uh, I, I'm sure you all know about it, Huang Long Bing. In uh, 2005, I think the first case, and by 2009, it had spread over the entire state. So that was very disturbing as a citrus lover. And in 2007, I got married and um, we bought a house in the South Bay and it came with the navel orange tree. And here you could see that navel orange tree with mini grafts. So, so really my efforts in the, the uh, condominium in San Francisco weren't, weren't so great, but once I had a yard, um, I, I could really go crazy with it. And on this tree, I think I grafted about 30 different varieties. You could see my little labels and aluminum foils. You'll see, see what the aluminum foil is for later in the presentation. And there's my little daughter, um, Hannah. And not long after I, I moved into that house, in California, in San Diego, we got this insect, the Asian citrus psyllid that spreads Huang Long Bing very readily. Um, and I, I have a little animation that shows how it, it spread very quickly over the state of California. So again, that's, that was very disturbing, the introduction of this insect that, um, spreads the, the most deadly disease of citrus. And in 2020, this insect exists pretty much all over the state of California. The whole state is, is uh, quarantined for this insect now. And in 2012, um, what happened is in a backyard in, uh, in, uh, in the San Gabriel Valley, um, the state of California has teams that survey, um, survey for insects and disease. And these surveyors discovered, uh, I think they first discovered an insect that had the Huang Lung being disease. And then after they discovered that insect, they did an extensive survey of backyards near that found, near that find, and they found a graft uh, in a certain backyard in, uh, I think, Hacienda Heights, a graft of a pumelo that had the first case of Huang Lung Bing in California. So again, that, that was really disturbing. And not, not long after that, I started my YouTube channel. The, uh, so this actually shows the... Um, that very first tree that has the, that was detected with the Huang Long Bing. And you could see where it spread. Um, that's, I think, as of early 2020, I think this map is a little out of date now. It's probably spread a little bit further. Um, but anyway, after I was so, so disturbed by this, and I had someone in my local CRFG chapter ask me about grafting because I had been doing this and they asked for an online resource. And I searched on Google and I noticed that everything about grafting in, um, on the web was, was wrong. And the YouTube videos showing how to graft citrus, they all showed grafting with, the, with budwood from the backyard which if people were to continue to do that in California, it would, it would lead to the spread of this disease all over the state. So this, this program that I had been using for many years, just because it was really cool 
to, um, to be able to graft hundreds of varieties of citrus in my own yard. It took on a new, new importance after the introduction of this disease into California. And um, after that, I started my YouTube channel with the goal of teaching people how they could do this graft and, and grow so many delicious fruits, but at the same time, avoid the spread of this disease. And so this is a shot of the, the YouTube channel. So the, the main focus is on, on grafting. So af after this is over, you, you can go watch these and, and get more detail. But I, I also have some videos on, on other things. Like I did a series of interviews with frequently asked questions that I get on the channel. That's about an hour worth of, of content that you will probably enjoy watching those some videos on ant control, a very popular or a very important topic. And also um, things you, you can do to avoid the spread of uh, HLB. So you can learn all about that. And I also have channels in other languages. And you can also hit the video video tab on the YouTube channel and you can see everything um, which you may not see in the other view. So now to our topic of grafting. So this, this is the, the most fundamental thing about grafting is uh, a, a layer of tissue between the bark and the wood. Here you see a, a, citrus, um, uh, a citrus cutting. It's about one and a half centimeters in diameter. And the object of grafting is to, gra is to connect this cambium layer, this tiny little, la little layer of tissue of your rootstock to your cyan. So, so everything I'm gonna be showing you is all about connecting the cambium layer, this tiny little layer of the rootstock to the cyan. And the techniques that I'm going to show you, I, I'll go in order of what I think are the easiest for beginners to uh, more challenging. And for the, the easiest techniques, just the way the technique works is you, it'll naturally connect the cambium layers of the rootstock and the cyan. So you, you don't, if you just follow the steps, you, you, you would be able to get a successful graft. But for the more challenging techniques, you, you need to really think about how to line up the cambium layer. But I have, have a lot of detailed instruction on how you can succeed at that. So a very important thing when grafting citrus is the temperature. Um, when you graft. So ideally you want something in the range of about 70 to 85 degrees. So you can look at the, the weather forecast and when you have something in that range forecast, that's good for grafting citrus. So let's say your, your weather forecast shows that the, the temperatures aren't going to be in that range then that's, that's not a good time to be grafting. Don't, don't even bother grafting citrus. But if you see something like this, then the, you're, that's good weather for grafting citrus because in these green areas, the, um, the wound, wounded citrus will heal readily when the temperatures are in this range. And also, even if those peaks were going above that range, that could also be a very good time for grafting citrus. Although you might, if the temperatures are above 85, you may wanna take some extra precautions on to keep the science from drying out, which I'll, I'll be showing as well. So I, I have a webpage that shows some of my, my favorite grafting tools and supplies. Uh, it's fruitmentor.com slash grafting tools. Uh, Parafilm 
is is very important. And uh, vinyl grafting tape is also um, very useful. So disinfecting tools with citrus is is very important, especially a lot of people um, will be in the HLB quarantined areas. So you could have HLB in your yard very easily and not even know it. So whenever you switch between trees, you want to be disinfecting your tools. And what I prefer to use is something called Clorox cleanup. Uh, it has just the right concentration of bleach to kill any pathogen of citrus. And um, you, you can also use some other things like, like Lysol if you're opposed to the use of bleach for some, some reason. Um, and you, you could even use alcohol in a pinch, but it, it doesn't work as well. To, if you want to kill every single um, citrus disease on your tools, bleach is the best thing to use, but you want to be sure to wash your tools thoroughly and oil them afterwards. But between, between graphs, you, you want to disinfect your tools. And it's, it's actually not, maybe it's not as important for some other varieties of fruit, but it, it's good practice for, for any type of grafting that you're going to do. So tea budding is, I, I would say is the, probably the easiest, most basic technique. And in a, a tea bud graft, actually the, the first three graphs that I'm going to show you, the, or graphs where the bark has to be slipping. So you see I'm peeling the bark back there. Um, so, so typically when this, when citrus, uh, when the temperatures in are, are in the range for uh, favorable citrus grafting, it should be easy to peel back the bark. Um, but one thing to understand is that that cambium layer, it's between the bark and the wood. So, so any type of grafting technique where the bark is peeling back, you would have some cambium cells on both the inside um, of the bark that you peel back and also on the underneath the bark on that part of the, the wood that's underneath. So you have some cambium layers on, on uh, both of those parts. So that's very conducive to healing as long as you, um, as long as your, your cyan has exposed cambium that touches that. And when you cut the, a bud for tea budding, just naturally, it's going to have that, that cambium contact when you insert the, the bud into that bark flap. So it has a very high success rate. Uh, one mistake I've made when tea budding is to use, use parafilm. Um, I've tried it with parafilm when I didn't have vinyl tape. Here you see I'm using vinyl tape. What I found is with, if you just use parafilm that sometimes the bark flaps can come apart and, and open up. And with, with any sort of grafting technique, you have to keep this apical dominance uh, into account. You have to make sure that your graft is, um, is not feeling the effect of apical domi dominance where hormones from a bud that's above your, newly, your new graft, those hormones can stop your, your graft from growing. So here I bent over the tree um, to get the bud to grow. And then you'll see that I love to do time lapses. So, so this here um, is a video that I've been working on. It's not published on the YouTube channel yet, but I plan to publish it um, this year. So this is a little less polished than some of the others. But this is, this is a bar graft, which may be I, I think this is my, my very favorite type of, of graft. It's, it's very easy. It gives a very high success rate. 
in this particular way that I'm, I'm showing is um, commonly used by citrus farmers in Australia and works very well. So first you take the cyan and you wrap, uh, wrap pear film all over the buds. And then you, um, you cut an angle, you, you cut off your, um, your rootstock and you, you pull back the bark flaps and you just insert that cyan into the, into the bark flap. One thing you, you may notice that the tree is, is uh, painted white, which um, whenever you do some ex extreme grafting on a citrus tree, you'll want to, to paint the bark of the tree. And what I like to do is if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or someplace like that in the paint department, they'll have uh, what they call oops paint. So for probably 50 cents, you can buy a nice little jar of paint that's, that's very white. Maybe it has, has some pigment in it, but you take that and you mix it with 50% water. And I, I just, I put it in a spray bottle and I just spray it all over the, the bark of the tree um, after I, I prune it to get it ready for grafting. Another thing I want to mention for, for citrus is that the, the rootstock that you're grafting onto is very important for the flavor of the fruit. And this, this particular example, this was a, a lemon tree and I had grafted a lot of mandarins to that. Um, I think probably about six years ago, I grafted it over to mandarins and the fruit was terrible. So often with a lemon rootstock, you, you could get, if you graft oranges or grapefruit or pomelo or some fruit like that, if you graft that to a lemon, you could get horrible fruit. Other lemon rootstocks, you may get fruit that um, isn't, isn't so terrible. Some people may even say it's acceptable quality, but, it, but that, that fruit um, won't be as good as if you had grafted to some normal rootstock for oranges. And I've also learned that some citrus nurseries, because lemon rootstocks grow faster than other rootstocks. Sometimes you'll find oranges grafted to the wrong rootstock if you're not if you're not careful. One thing I'd like to point out here, uh, I hope you could see my mouse cursor is this this area here that I'm leaving uh, ab above, um, I'm not, not putting that wounded area all the way in. I'm leaving that out and that is going to assist with the healing of the graft later on. And here, in a lot of my videos, I've used parafilm and rubber bands, but for this graft, I've found that the vinyl tape works, works very well. So here I'm just wrapping it tightly with vinyl tape. And then after I do that, I apply masking tape. And the reason for the masking tape you'll see shortly is to keep the grafting seal from seeping into that area between, um, between the sign and the rootstock. Because if the grafting seal were to get in there, it could interfere with the healing of the graft. There's actually a product called Doc Farwell's grafting seal that you may or may not be familiar with that I actually prefer to this, this dark colored grafting seal. Um, but I chose to use this dark colored grafting seal, seal in this video just because I think it's more readily available. If you can get the Doc Farwell's, it's great. But if you can't, you can use some, um, some black grafting seal like this, but I don't think I, I have, it, it will be shown in this clip, but later on I, I end up painting that white because I don't like 
in this this particular graph, the temperatures forecast a week for the next week were a hundred a hundred degrees and above. So um, actually, you'll see I my trick to get the graph to survive in that weather is to wrap it with aluminum foil. And that aluminum foil will reflect the sunlight and um, prevent the graft from drying out. And when I, I did this graft, I, gra I grafted, I think almost every, every branch of that tree. And I think all but maybe two or three succeeded even with that, that weather above a hundred degrees. And that, so that bark graft, you can do it the same, same way for, for many other fruits. Uh, stone fruit in particular is, um, I've, I've used that with a lot. It's very useful. But with other, with other types of grafts or other types of fruits, um, I wouldn't be grafting it in the summertime. I do it when it's dormant, like with stone fruit, I would graft stone fruit um, as it's starting to bloom would be a better time to graft stone fruit than waiting for that warmer weather. So this next type of, of graft is called patch budding. And I, I think this may be one of the easiest techniques for citrus, although it's probably a little less versatile than bark grafting because you need the bark to be slipping on both the cyan and the rootstock. So there, I I, uh, I pulled a patch off of the cyan, and I just uh, used vinyl tape. That, that's actually very slippery. So I grafted that. Um, And here, here that's um, breaking ap apical dominance. You cut off the top and then you cut that notch and it breaks the apical dominance. This, this next technique that I'm going to show is chip budding. And here finally, we have a, a technique where you need to pay attention to the cambium layer. <clears throat> here I'm tracing the outline of the cambium layer on these, these, uh, this photograph of the, um, of the chip and of the, the rootstock. So that, that black line roughly shows where the cambium layer is. So if you, if you just stuck that in there and you tried to line it up perfectly, you might think, oh, this, this graft is, is going to uh, work perfectly. But you, you could be wrong on that because that the most important thing is to line up the cambium layer so you see that the cambium layers are not touching. So when you do a graft like this, the most important thing is to line up the cambium layers and having the, the chip just stick in there perfectly isn't necessarily the best way. So what I like to do is tilt the chip a little bit in such a way that it guarantees that the um, cambium layers will be lined up. There you see they'd be lined up in at least two points. So this shows a real example. Um, but you'll, you'll see that when I insert the chip and I get it lined up before I wrap it with parafilm, um, it, it, because it, it's skewed a little bit and it's not, um, lined up exactly, that cambium layer is gonna be guaranteed to line up. And when it he heals, it'll just fill in all of the, the other wounded portions. So there's the healed chip. 
and then I break a apical dominance to get it to grow. So the next technique will be the cleft graft. So the, the cleft graft is another technique where you have to be very careful about lining up the cambium layers. Again, if you just stuck it in there so the bark is even, the cambium layers, which you see in that, that reveal might not be lined up and your graft might fail. But if the trick is to just tilt it a little bit and that's going to guarantee that the cambium is lined up in at least two points. And as you watch this graft, you'll, you'll see at the end, the healed tissue, that even though I, I didn't line it up perfectly, that that callus tissue uh, fills, in, um, fills in the, um, the open spaces. There I'm wrapping it with parafilm. And then I use a rubber band after that. And then another layer of parafilm. And on this one, I used the aluminum foil trick also, but I think I, I cut that out. Oh no, I did leave that. There you can see that callus tissue filled in all the, the open spaces. This third technique called Z grafting is actually, if we go back to bark grafting, I forgot to mention one of the, the cases where bark grafting is most useful when you have a rootstock of a much greater diameter than the cyan. So in that case, the, the bark graft is, is great. The cleft graft is really useful if your cyan and rootstock are in uh, similar diameters. But the, for this graft, the Z graft, this comes in most handy if you have a rootstock that has a small diameter and your cyan has a larger diameter, which is the case of the, the, the uh, graph that I'm going to show you, as well as this animation. You can see that that, that um, cyan on top is a bigger diameter. And this Z graph has, you get a lot of cambium contact just by the way this Z graph works. But this, I'd say this is a, a more, more challenging technique. And if you do find a a case where you want to try this Z graft, I would highly recommend that you take some cuttings from some trees at home. Just take a lot of cuttings of different diameters and uh, practice grafting your cuttings to each other before you try with some real budwood that you care about. And I also have this, um, this ebook. So there, there's so much about, about grafting. And I don't think I could take the time to tell everything about grafting. But I, I've written a little ebook 
which you can download for free on my website if you go to fruitmentor.com slash grafting tips. And that will also get you on my email list. Um, and you'll learn later some, it may, you may enjoy being on the email list for learning about my new publications and also upcoming citrus varieties. So switching to that part of the talk, I'm going to show you um, I'm going to show you upcoming citrus varieties. Let's see. So one thing I learned uh, in working on this this YouTube channel. So the one of the my goals was to um, to teach people about the CCPP and that they could use the CCPP to order disease free budwood of so many different varieties. But one one problem still is that there are varieties out there that people may want to grow that the CCPP doesn't have yet. And as as I showed before. The way the Huanglong Bing got into California is because some people from Asia smuggled budwood of some, some varieties that they wanted to grow into California. If they had just submitted their budwood to the CCPP and gotten the, the CCPP would have been very happy to um, remove the diseases and make that available if those people had just known. So a lot of the problem is just educating people about this, this issue. Um, but what I realized through the, my YouTube channel is just having an audience uh, of people who are interested in this stuff that the audience could help me figure out what needs to be, what needs to be introduced that hasn't been introduced. So I just naturally out of the YouTube channel and the website and, and being able to email people who, who love this, I've, I've learned about a lot of varieties that ought to be introduced. And year before last, I proposed a project to the Citrus Research Board to get some funding to, to do this on a larger scale than I'd just been doing on my own. And they funded the project. So I did my first year of the project last year and they, they liked what I, what I did and they funded it for another year. So I'm gonna show you some varieties that I initiated based on this, this Citrus Research Board project. And then I'll give, I'll explain how you can help um, help to introduce other varieties to California. Um, basically get your feedback for this project. So what I did is I emailed, I just sent an email to my audience um, and I asked what, for everyone in California, what would you like to grow that you can't grow? And I, I got a lot of very helpful responses um, and learned a lot of varieties that people are interested in that are not available from the CCPP. And actually another, another so that's, that's one category of thing is just things people would like to grow that they can't. But also some varieties, they may have already been smuggled into California and people may be growing those outside of the CCPP. Those are actually very, very dangerous. And one of these I discovered uh, many years ago, it's a, a Vietnamese variety and it's been sold by a lot of Vietnamese nurseries in California. It's called Boy Oi. And if there's anyone who speaks Vietnamese, uh, I apologize for the bad pronunciation, but this, this fruit is, um, it's somewhat dry and it's acidless. And it's very popular for the Vietnamese New Year. And I think a lot of people wouldn't appreciate the dry dryness of the fruit. But one thing that's nice about that is when you 
when you peel the fruit, it doesn't get your hands um, all juicy. So that's one nice thing that, that uh, people like about the dry fruit. But this variety is a severe disease threat because a lot of these uh, nurseries have propagated it with non-certified budwood. Um, I actually tried to introduce this three different times and I failed three times. The first two times were from someone's yard in uh, San Jose where, uh, where a website reader uh, found that tree for me. And the, that failed twice, I wore it my welcome. And then she found another tree in Orange County. And I tried that one time and it failed. And then I worked with the CCPP. So they changed their procedure. So that shoot tip grafting, it's really hard, but now they, they make a backup tree. So with that backup tree, um, they, they do have this, the CCPP now. So the introduction of this variety has started. So this next variety, uh, Feminello uh, Fusato, this was a highly requested variety. It's a very famous Italian lemon. And I got a lot of requests for this in both English and Spanish. And it, most people ask for um, Fusato Amalfatino or Sorrento lemon, but it's the same thing as this Feminello Fusato, which is the, uh, um, the proper name. So this one, um, this one has been initiated. And this one, in this case, it actually already existed at the Citrus Variety Collection. It's just that they didn't realize um, that there was such a demand for it and they, they, cause there are other Feminello lemons, so they didn't introduce it, but the feedback showed that this one needs to be introduced. So the, the introduction of that one has started. Um, so this one um, is from a nursery in Fremont. This was imported from Japan in the late 19th century. So this is an heirloom variety and the Citrus Research Board was, was basically very receptive to anything that's been sold by a nursery that um, was not in CCPP. And this, the source tree um, from which I collected the budwood isn't productive. It's in the, there are a lot of really tall trees around it now. A um, hundred years ago, the, it was all, I think it was all citrus trees but that source tree is no longer productive, but we did find uh, one fruit under the tree. So we suspect this is one of the fruits and we, we tasted it and it was, it was nice. This next one is called Allspice Tangelo. And this one is also in the citrus variety collection. It's a cross of a, um, a grapefruit in a willow leaf mandarin from uh, 1917. And this escaped the citrus variety collection via seeds. With some citrus varieties, if you plant a seed, you'll, um, it may take you know, 10, 15 years, but if you let that seed grow with certain varieties, you'll get a clone of the, the mother plant. So that's how it escaped from the citrus variety collection. So, because it's, it's already out there, it's, that's an important one to introduce as well. And people were asking for it. So the introduction was initiated in 2020 and it has a, a sort of a spicy flavor that's unusual in, in other citrus. And the next one, it's a, another uh, pomelo variety called Satin Yao or Shatian, depending on, uh, I think one is, is Cantonese and one is uh, Mandarin. It's a very famous Chinese pomelo variety. And that's also from the citrus variety collection. The next one is called Shikwasa or citrus depressa. It's a small, very sour Mandarin. It's a very famous Japanese variety. If you, you Google this, you'll see there's a lot of material 
on the internet in Japanese and English. And I read Coca-Cola has a Fanta drink with this flavor in Japan. So that one is being introduced. Um, the next one is called Ujukitsu, and this tastes like a sweet lemon. So um, it has acidity, but, but it also has, um, it has sugar. So it has a nice sweet lemony taste and um, people, people were requesting that. So that one is being introduced. So, so how can you help? If you know of any citrus variety that you think ought to be introduced, um, or if, if there's a variety you'd like to grow that's not available from the CCPP, send me an email and, and uh, just tell me what that variety is and be as specific as possible. Like if you just say, oh, I want new blood orange varieties, that's, that's not very helpful. But if you give a specific variety name, then that, that would be helpful. And another thing, if you, if you know something that's, you know, maybe it's been smuggled into the, the country or it's the signs have been traded illicitly, um, that would be a good candidate for introduction because if there's something that people want to grow, um, it's, it's just so important to make that available with the, the disease-free budwood so we don't spread Huang Long Bing. And um, so, so even if it's something that's illicit, that's, that's very welcome. And if you want, if you know of something like that and the donor wants to be, remain anonymous, that's quite possible as well. So um, I can work with you on that. So just email me at dan at fruitmentor.com. Well, good deal. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for uh, a wonderful presentation and uh, sharing fantastic overview of grafting and, uh, and I'm really excited about how you're gathering this research from various folks on these different varieties. So many beautiful finger limes. It's incredible. Um, so thank you so much again for coming and uh, now it's time for some Q and A. Um, if folks wouldn't mind, if you have a specific question, I know there are many that hadn't been already addressed and that you think, uh, you know, would be pertinent for the moment, please, if you've already, uh, written it, wrote it in the chat window, please repost it so that we can have that. Uh, you can copy and paste it to have it send to the forefront. Um, and yeah, take them as they come again. So I wonder, is it better to go to gallery, just go to gallery mode or maybe it, it might, depending on the question, it might be useful to share the presentation again, but maybe we do that if the question demands it. Yeah, I think we could stay. It was, in. it was so weird to be giving the presentation with no <laughs> feedback of any kind. <laughs> yeah, into the void. <laughs> well, I'm excited to answer some questions. Right. Um, and then we can also selectively, uh, as I call out a question, if it's your question, um, Robert, do we have it set up that they can unmute themselves at this point? Um, I don't. I think so, but we can give them permission to yeah. unmute. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, it's possible if, if you need to do a clarification that you can um, unmute yourself, but we'll just try and do this in some form of an orderly fashion. So I'll go through some questions now. Um, all right, so... Um, there was a question, if you know Anmal Joshi. The hey. name is, it's not ringing a bell. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, Sally Holly mentioned that she has a finger line that's been in the ground for 15 years, only 17 inches and gives two or three fruit a year. Any ideas for improving? 
maybe buy a new tree <laughs> and get, and give it lots of, you could, for, number one, if you really want to get that one to fruit, you can try giving, giving it some fertilizer. When, one thing that I really like to use on citrus is um, fish emulsion. Um, I find if you, actually, we, it may be a little late, but I think December is probably an ideal time. You could, you could spray um, something with nitrogen directly on the leaves. You, like fish emulsion, I think works well. And um, if you want to use uh, chemical type fertilizer, miracle Grow for tomatoes, if you mix some of that up and spray it directly on the leaves it has trace nutrients for citrus, that's kind of a good rehabilitation plan for citrus that's not fruiting. Um, but if you, if you do that in, um, I think December is a really good time to spray that nitrogen sort of fertilizer directly, but not pure, like you need, it needs to be diluted. Um, actually, I, I don't remember the exact, exact amount. Maybe, maybe I need, need to, I could, I could, you could post it later if I, I look that up and people would like to hear that, but spraying diluted nitrogen fertilizer on the leaves, you, you definitely don't want too much because it'll burn the leaves, but I have to get back to you on the exact right amount. But if, if you fertilize it, citrus likes a lot of fertilizer. So uh, if you're, that's a basic thing. If your fr tree isn't fruiting, try fertilizing it. But for that, that one, if it's 15 years and it, it's not growing, I, maybe you need a new tree. <laughs> yeah, what about um, potassium nitrate, um, you know, that they spray on mangoes to induce uh, flowering and fruiting? That, that may do the job. I'm, I'm not, so I heard this, there's, there's some research on this published and I'm not sure exactly what form of nitrogen that they used spraying on the, on the leaves. Um, I haven't read the original article. I, I heard it from someone who's applied it in his garden using miracle Grow, and I've tried it myself using miracle Grow for tomatoes and it, it worked, it works well. And then I, I suspect that the fish emulsion may work even better. Although I, I saw, saw in some YouTube channel, there's someone claiming that fish emulsion doesn't work, but my, my results seem to indicate that it does, or maybe I've used products that have other forms of nitrogen in them. Okay, well, next question. How many, if you know, how many cells thick is a cambium layer? I, I don't know that. Just, I think it's just a, just a few. It's, it's not, not a lot of cells. Okay. Um, Margaret Frain had a shout out of thank you and great talk. Uh, Thank you. She's president of the CFG. Um, it, I, there's mention here that there's supposed to be a red finger lime coming out in beta test form in California. I don't know if, if that's a comment. Should I should I respond? If you'd like, <laughs> yeah. But if you so, know more, or have any? Well, I, know, I know that I know that the. UC Riverside is, is working on some stuff in this area, but I, I guess I think um, introducing some directly from Australia would be a very good way to get uh, more finger limes into California. But there, there are other projects in this area going on and I would, I will have to make the case to the Citrus Research Board to make make this happen. Ty, there are quite a few questions on yeah. um, the uh, peptide that the finger lime has that's supposed to fight um, the HLB virus. Do you know anything about that, Dan? So this year, I expect to actually work with uh, the person who's doing the research on that and uh, publish a video about that. But what I can tell you is that UC Riverside uh, published some press release about this technology that was uh, probably not thought out as well as it ought to have been. 
but there is some promising technology um, where it looks like there may be this antibacterial peptide from the Australian finger lime that will be made into a product that can be sprayed on um, citrus trees to kill HLB. And it, it's very promising technology. But the, the thing that hasn't been well thought out is like, and if you were to apply that in Florida, that's great because the, the whole state is, is pretty much wiped out. There's HLB everywhere in Florida. But if people in uh, California were to take the approach of, oh, well, we just let HLB run its course and uh, let people spray this stuff on their trees if they want their trees to live, that would cause the disease to actually spread very rapidly, in my opinion, because the, the state of California is taking very aggressive measures in urban areas like Orange County to track down and destroy any affected uh, any tree infected by HLB. But if you just let it let it spread, then the only people that will be able to grow citrus trees are the ones who would be the ones who would be spraying this stuff on their trees. It would it could actually have the effect of causing the disease disease to spread more rapidly. But that's that's my that's my thought on the the issue. And I I haven't. Um, had this deep discussion with uh, um, the scientist who's working on it, but talking to the director of the CCPP, um, I guess I, I, my understanding is that the, this press release from UC Riverside was um, a little misleading, if that's what people are referring to. Makes, okay. it, makes the technology seem a little, little rosier than um, it's currently known to be. Okay, so it's not as simple as just taking a finger lime rootstock and putting any other citrus that you want on the top of it. And it's oh, no, no. It, so you, you, <laughs> it, may, it may be that if, if all you're interested in growing in, in, is uh, finger limes, then maybe you don't have to be too worried about HLB. Right. Um, because I think the, the, the one that California already has does have the right genetics that uh, it would be tolerant of HLB. Okay, a couple other questions. Uh, actually, a lot of other questions. But uh, so the, on the temperature range, you had shown the graph with the 70 to 85 degree uh, range. How many hours in a day does it need to be in that range? Um, it just would, needs to hit it at least. I think, I think that there. I haven't done enough research to really understand that. I, okay. you know, I do grafting as a, as a hobby and to really understand that would take some serious research, but I can tell you that I've grafted at the wrong time of year where I'm not seeing those, those temperatures. And it, it seems to be sort of a, a gradual decline, like, I think I've grafted maybe in November in the San Francisco Bay Area where this new variety that I was just so excited to grow, it was released, I think, in November. So I ordered the budwood. I ordered as much budwood as I could. And I, I grafted a lot of scions. And one of them took, even in November. But a large number of those scions died. So... Um, and, and considering the temperature, I think if you're getting into that range, then you should have a decent success rate. But in terms of number of hours per day, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, have you tried grafting to yuzu rootstocks? Um, if so, how do they affect the flavors of the grafted citrus? So I haven't done it myself. However, I know that yuzu is widely used as a rootstock in, in Japan and maybe some other Asian countries. I think it, it may be tolerant of some citrus diseases. I'm not sure the effect on flavor, but just the fact that it's, I think it's commonly used in Japan indicates probably the flavor is, would be pretty good. 
but one th one thing about Japan is they there's a lot of they have a lot of disease problems in Japan. Like there's certain citrus fruits they can't even grow um, because the the disease situation is so so bad there. All right. Do you have any tips for creating a cocktail citrus tree on an existing grafted tree? Um, I think. There was mention of that in some of your resources. Um, and can I mix citrus types on a single tree? Um, so one thing, if you if you want to do that, I highly recommend that you go to the my website and download that ebook, fruitmentor.com slash grafting tips. It has a lot of tips on that. Um, but when, I guess some tips, um, it, it is quite possible to mix different, different varieties on a tree. Um, as I, I mentioned in the talk, like the lemon, lemon rootstock, you probably don't want to, if you have a lemon rootstock, you probably don't want to graft um, oranges, grapefruits, pomelos to any sort of lemon rootstock. So to some lemon rootstock, you may get acceptable flavor, but if you're a member of the CRFG, you probably really care about flavor. So maybe you just don't want to do that at all. Um, but so if you if you do want a multi variety tree, you could graft. Like w one thing that I I did so I, so I mentioned I showed my first house um, in California and all those grafts I did those turned out really wonderful. But that tree was was probably super old, like maybe probably maybe as old as nineteen seventies, and maybe the nurseries were using good rootstock. But then I moved to another house and I tried the same grafting. I thought, okay, I'm grafting to another navel tree at this house. I grafted some, some blood orange. I got a good result. Then I grafted a pumelo. And then the flavor of that fruit was quite, flavor and texture was quite disappointing. And when I got that result, I realized, oh, it's because it's on a lemon type rootstock. So to really be sure that you're going to get good flavored fruit, the, the original rootstock of the tree is the most important. Uh, what's the best rootstock if you're growing in a container on a balcony? Um, well, I, maybe, maybe, that, maybe it depends. I think if you, want, if you just want a low a slow growing tree, then maybe flying dragon would be a nice rootstock for that application. But for me, I, I kind of like my trees to grow faster. So even um, in a container, I might grow it with Carrizo or C35, um, something like, like that. Recently, I've discovered there these pots, root pruning pots that seem to work pretty well, even with those uh, rootstocks that give the larger trees, even um, when planting in a container. So I, I, moving to Australia two years ago, I had to um, abandon all of my, sadly abandon all of my citrus in California and start over. But uh, at first we had a rental house, now we have our own place, but I started with these root pruning containers and then I, I've, I've been going with the um, non-dwarf rootstocks, but some people might prefer the dwarf. Uh, do finger limes graft well? Um, I actually don't have that much experience. The only finger lime I ever grafted was I grafted one to a lemon tree and it barely grew. It didn't work well at all. So it may be it may be more challenging to graft finger limes than other things is it's just kind of what I suspect. But I don't I just have one experience doing that and it didn't work well. Uh, There's mentioned that it looked like you covered the entire bud uh, with vinyl tape. Does that hinder the bud growing? Um, well, I, I cut I cut the presentation down considerably so it wouldn't be too long and boring. And then just if you want to see more detail, just go to the YouTube channel. But any case where I cover with vinyl tape, it has to be removed or the bud won't grow. 
Um, there was a clarification question, I guess. Uh, if the finger lime can be grafted to a regular lime or lemon tree, which I think you covered, the lemon may affect the flavor. Is that correct? And, uh, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on rootstocks for finger, okay. finger limes. I think it, and another thing is with, with citrus, there's so many combinations. It's like if you, if you do the math for, um, you know, just different combinations of citrus, there, there are a lot of things that will end up not being compatible for, for various reasons. And just because I tried the finger lime on a Eureka lemon doesn't mean that it's not going to work on another type of lemon or a lime. And I suspect that the flavor on a lemon type rootstock for finger lime would be fine. All right, of all the unusual varieties you grew, which would be your favorite three? <laughs> oh, uh, I, I really love the Bokobza Maltese Blood Orange. That is one of my very favorites. I really love Taroko Blood Oranges. Although the the ones that exist in California now have a bit of a genetic defect. So I, that makes them very slow to bear fruit. Like I've grafted one of those and it, like even grafting to a navel tree, I think it took five years for it to bear fruit, even grafting onto an existing tree. And then I made my own tree. I think it took, maybe it took more than five years for that to bear fruit. And that, I think that's one reason why um, you can't find Taroko blood oranges in the store is because the, the varieties in California have this, this defect. They take a really long time to fruit. Okay, so we need a third, third favorite variety. That, that's, that's so hard. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I, I have to list more than three. How about gold nugget mandarin, um, pixie mandarin, um, USDA 88-2. Oh, that has a new name now. It's called Superna now. That's the new name for that one. Right on. That's a good list to start with. So folks can source those from the CCPP? Right. Most. Um, and I, I'm, I'm also, I talked about the introductions I'm working on for, for my project, but I've also been working on introducing new Taroko blood oranges. So that's something to look out for in the future. Um, are there any finger lime varieties without heavy thorns? They're pretty thorny. All the ones I have in my garden now are seem to be pretty thorny. <laughs> okay. I, 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 so I, I, there may be some without, with less prominent thorns, but I don't know about that. How long does it take for a citrus graft to heal? Um, I think temperature has a lot to do with it, but if the conditions are good, maybe three, three weeks, um, three or four weeks, it, normally they're healed. But just because I, I've seen, I have so many people email me about their, their grafting. And what I see is a lot of people, they're just so curious to see if the graft is healed or not. And then they unwrap their cyan graft to see. Uh, <laughs> to Curiosity see if, killed the yeah, graft. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You, you unwrap your graft too early, it's gonna yeah. kill it. So if it's a, a bud, bud graft, like a chip bud or the, you know, a tea bud or the patch bud, you up, unwrap it after after three or four weeks, it should be just fine. But if it's a cyan graft, there's there's really no reason to un, unwrap it. You just leave it for a long time. And like, except if you have a, if you use the vinyl tape, you wanna be sure you cut it off soon enough. But if you use rubber bands and pear film, then you can leave that uh, for a really long time. Okay. Um, one, uh, one person's citrus fruit tree almost died, but resurrected. How do I find out if it was caused by HLB? 
it's it almost died but it resurrected mm -hmm. um you can call um find your local master master gardener um there, there's a, a web a website should i see if i can find that sure Oh, I know, I know where, where I can find it very easily. Man, these questions keep on coming. <laughs> Dan, are you looking for the hotline for master gardeners? Um, so I'm looking for a particular article. Okay, let me let me share this. So I have I have a lot of articles in uh, with embedded YouTube videos on my website. Um, here I interviewed Georgios Vitalakis, the director of the Citrus Clonal Protection Program, and in this article I have all these links. So you. So it's it's a really good video. It it has you know a few few questions that aren't you know the smartest questions, but still questions that you know people people are asking that they're curious about citrus disease. But basically, the if you you go to these between these three three links in this article, you can figure out where where to go. Um, but I, I highly recommend these, these interviews. I think, I think y'all will really enjoy those. Um, I did, did five interviews. Uh, this one with, uh, Ashraf El Karimi, it has some more general, um, questions and answers, but he, I think this one even touched on the disease as well and like where you can go okay um you might have to do some uh abbreviated versions not that not that you're long-winded necessarily but just abbreviated okay. versions for responses so you have a lot of to, questions so you want me to go faster yeah just to, okay. i mean we could also cut it at any point that um you know but well, if, i'm, I'm, I'm it's, it's 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 just afternoon here so i'm ha <laughs> happy to happy to keep going as long as you want but i'll try to go fast so we can okay. get to as many as yeah. we can yeah that was get everyone answered um all right uh um, my finger lime gets dead tips. It doesn't seem to make any problems because it fruits heavily, but isn't very pretty. Any suggestions? It's pretty busy work to snip off all those small twigs. Sorry, I, I don't have any idea for that. Just snip them off. <laughs> Our lime tree has many leaves with yellow burnt leaves on the tips. Any idea why? It did produce many limes this year. Some are still on it. I don't know. Okay. You for if, if I'm if you're if I'm puzzled by one of the questions, y'all might want to go back and watch those interview videos with some, you know, maybe you get some ideas or you understand where you can get help. Okay. Our two finger limes are about eight years old. Oh, this might be um this is just a comment, but uh, our finger limes are about eight years old and they are each about three foot by three foot with no fertilizer and not a lot of water. Uh, they fruit every year, but not a lot. And certainly not the huge fruit that Denny has. Denny's look like pickles. <laughs> All right, I'll skip the, the commentary. More, more fertilizer could yeah. help, I think. Right. Um, more light sometimes. All right, is it safe to pick up finger limes from nurseries now or should we wait to purchase uh, new citrus still. I, I don't really understand the question. I, th I think the question is relating to um, plants that are certified to be clean uh, from the nurseries and, and if it's safe anything, to purchase. It, 
yeah, anything you buy from a nursery should be fine. You, you go to a nursery. But the thing is, be aware of the quarant quarantines and make sure you, you observe the, the quarantines. Um, I've got a, a video on that <laughs> if you want to learn about that. <laughs> But anything that's, that's sold by, um, as long as it's a, a reputable nursery, like if you, if you see someone uh, sell, uh, who pulled up a big truck into a shopping center and unloads a whole bunch of trees into the parking lot, you probably don't want to buy citrus from them. But if it's like a normal nursery, then it should be fine. Okay. Um, how can we try all the unique citrus varieties that exist? Is there a place where we can sample several varieties at a time or order sampler packs of fruits to be delivered? That'd be nice. <clears throat> so actually maybe, maybe someone from another chapter who's, who's in California and has paid attention could, could say if they've already had this, but at I know that they were planning for it this month in January. It may have already happened, but there's a yearly tasting. And I know they were going to do it even with COVID by observing, you know, whatever the uh, protocols are. But there's a tasting at UC Rivers or UC Lincove. It's in the Central Valley. And I mean, even if you're in Orange County, it's, it's worth it to drive up there for this tasting. They do it on a Saturday. So as long as you're not working on a, a Saturday, um, you could drive up there and taste it. So. Great. One problem with that is that a lot of the varieties that you taste aren't really ripe at the time that they have the tasting since they only have the tasting at that one time. So it makes it a little difficult sometimes to judge the real flavor of the fruit when it's yeah, not that, it's that is peaks. true that I, I agree that is a problem with that tasting another thing you could do um is every year the ccpp has a walkthrough at a certain day uh they they choose a one day a year and they normally have a walkthrough and they'll have a tasting there and you may be able to to visit that. Okay. Um, there's also the Citrus Historic Park. Is that what that's called? In Riverside. I don't know enough about it, but I'd heard yeah, something that, about that, tastings over there. That's a good idea too. I've, I've never been there when the park was open. There are all these signs that say, don't, um, don't pick the fruit, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Someone, Drew asked, what is your favorite citrus variety ever? He's trying to whittle it down to one. <laughs> well, it, it seemed like the previous question said, which one that you grew at home, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think that might have been the... Mm -hmm. I think so, it was that you've grown, yeah. That I've grown. There's another one that I haven't grown that... It may, it may be the best that I've ever tasted, but it may, you know maybe that's arguable. But it's Daisy SL, which is very. I think you you can't even get it, so that's that's a problem. Is it a mandarin or what is it? Yeah, it's a mandarin, huh. and actually, just just plain Daisy is is really nice, but it has it's quite seedy. But the scientists at UC Riverside they irradiated some budwood of that to induce the mutation that would make it seedless but they they've had some problems with that variety where that would i think they've created what's called a chimera where there are multiple layers of cells and one they have one layer of cells that is seedless and one layer that's not and sometimes it reverts to the seeded form which is a big problem for farmers but maybe not such a big deal if you're growing it in your backyard but daisy sl is um really fantastic but it also depends on where you grow it in northern california i think it's it's not as good as um central valley or southern california 
what would you say is the best time of year to graft in SoCal or when would be the, or when would the citrus be slipping, the bark be slipping? I guess. Well, I, I haven't lived there. So okay. I've lived in Northern California and for me, it would be May. So I, I would guess it would be maybe earlier, maybe right. April. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Best place to get citrus root stocks. Um, I know there, there are some nurseries, I think Four Winds sell some online, but for me, I've actually had good success just buying, buying really cheap trees at Walmart. Um, I know that the, they use a good nursery. I mean, you might think Walmart, you get, you get cheap trees that aren't any good, but they actually use the right rootstock. They may have uninteresting varieties, but all of the oranges, they're grafted on C35. So if you go to Walmart and you buy an orange tree, um, I think, I, you know, I can't say with 100% certainty, but probably 99% certainty that would be grafted on C35, which is a very good rootstock. And if you buy one of those, you can graft an orange, a grapefruit, a pumelo, and you, you don't have to be as worried about, um, I think if you order from some places, you get rootstocks with a really tiny diameter that are hard to graft. But if you buy a tree, a cheap tree at Walmart, you, you get something that has uh, enough diameter that it's gonna be easier to graft to. Uh, someone did make note that they have many varieties grafted to a Costco Mexican lime root stock and all varieties taste excellent. So cheap trees to get. Um, is it safe to plant seeds of store-bought citrus? That is, can diseases be spread by growing seeds? They can be spread by growing seeds. I would say never plant a seed of a grocery store fruit. Um, if it's a Actually, the, recently a new disease was detected, I think somewhere in Southern California. And the theory is that it came from a grocery store fruit because um, that disease is transmitted by seed. Mm -hmm. So that's the likely theory on how that disease got into California. Um, so I think particularly imports, imported fruit would probably be more risky for that. But I, I think, yeah. And I, I recommend always grafting rather than trying to plant something from a seed because you don't know if it's new seller or not anyway. And then even if it is new seller, it may take you wait 10 years to get a fruit. And then um, you may also get a tree that has these juvenile characteristics. Like it's very, very thorny. So I recommend always grafting. Do any diseases go from one citrus, like an orange to a lime tree easily? Probably most diseases. Um, but I mean, when you say easily, it depends on, you know, the, whether they're vectors, like it could be your grafting knife if you don't, if you don't sterilize it or, um, Pruning tools. Yeah, pruning tools. Um, there was a question if you can get a better Taroko cultivar to have better growth slash precociousness. Yes, that's actually, that's something I'm working on. Soil type preferences for citrus, like iron. I don't know if this is a comment or question. Well draining is the most important thing. It doesn't like, citrus doesn't like clay soil. Yeah. Okay, but acidity or anything like that is not uh, so critical. I think it, they do like a bit of acidity, but I, I think well draining is the, the most important, but acidity, they do like slight acidity. Um, 
There was mention that UCI Extension Center did a citrus U pick last year. They had a lot of varieties. Um, so some folks you can look that up. UC Irvine. Hi. Tom, yep. it yep. wasn't UC Irvine. It was the South Coast Research Center. Um, mm you know, scrack and right. uh, oh yeah, so it's it's UCA and R, not UC right. that would that did that. Gotcha. We'll just have to see if they're able to do that again this year. Right. I know they've been continuing with the uh Cherimoyas. Well not the tastings per se, but the right. They've the had sale. the sales. Mm -hmm. Right. And the persimmons. Uh, any uh Recommend a pH of water for citrus? It, it likes slightly acidic. I know the, the farmers, I think they, they um, make the water slightly acidic. I'm not sure what pH exactly. Maybe if you spend some time on Google, you could figure that out. Okay. And it looks like the last one. We may have reached the end here. Oh, all right. Uh, could brown tips uh, of leaves be from salt, chlorine, or chloramine in water. It happens to house plants. Maybe I'm I'm <laughs> not enough of an expert to. Right on. Tell you. All right. Um, well, thanks so much, Dan. This is fun. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, and John, do you have any final thoughts or words? Well, I'm just impressed with the, the skill set of all the grafting techniques. You know, we we just focus on the common ones, uh, cleft and uh, and those type for uh, you know, stone fruit and things that are available now. I just wonder how those sorts of other sorts of graftings would go on things like mangoes and uh, avocados and uh tropical fruits as well as citrus so well, I, yeah. I have i have some of those in my yard now i'm looking forward to figuring that out <laughs> okay well we uh, might be able to pass some information on to you when we do our work uh, in that direction yeah. 